All right, welcome everyone. Hope you're having a fantastic day. My name is Chanel Hasten. I am the Director of Outreach and Community Relations for the Alaka Alliance. And tonight we have a special webinar on the art of science and envisioning information with Sky Moray. So just first off, I'm gonna give a little summary on uh, the Alaka Alliance before I pass it over to Sky. So at the Alaka Alliance, our mission is to restore a healthy population of sea otters here on the Oregon coast and in the process help make Oregon's marine ecosystem more robust and resilient. And our name, Alaka, is based on the Chinook, um, oops, I thought I missed this slide. Hold on. No, I didn't. Uh, before I talk more about that, let me throw at you our wonderful board of directors. Uh, we have a great accredited and um, fantastic board of directors, as you can see here. We have some tribal members, uh, professors, and accomplished people in the zoo and aquarium world, attorneys, and we have some very wonderful people. So if you want to learn more about them, you can check them out on our website and read their bios, but we're very lucky to have such an eager team behind us at the Alaka Alliance. So our strategic objectives, uh, we are working to assess uh, right now a feasibility study and an economic impact assessment on sea otter reintroduction. So the pros and cons of bringing them back to the Oregon coast. So that will be available August 1st for public comment. So be on the lookout for that. And so from there, we're hoping to reach a consensus on restoration and therefore if warranted, bring back sea otters to the Oregon coast in very carefully chosen locations. You can visit us online. Uh, we have a very thorough website. If you have any questions about sea otters or the history of sea otters in Oregon, check out our Alaka library on there. It is very robust. Uh, if you are a fan of social media, we are on all your favorite channels, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. So be sure to look at us on there. So I want to welcome Sky Moray. She is a friend of mine and also just a fantastic human being with excellent stories. Uh, she's a data-driven designer and marine scientist. Her diverse background on the ocean, having sailed over 100,000 plus nautical miles around the globe, fuels her abiding interest in the power of art and design to engage citizens with ecological complexity and dependencies of our planet. So without further ado, Sky. Welcome. Thanks, Chanel. Lovely introduction. And it's, I'm so excited to be speaking with you, um, the Alaka Alliance. My, my students actually, um, in the last couple of years, worked with you guys on kind of systems mapping. Um, and so I was excited to, you know, kind of start following you guys and, and um, become engaged. So I will, yeah, I'll plan on speaking for about you know, 40 minutes, and then I'll, we'll kind of try to leave 15 minutes for questions. Um, and I did have some internet issues yesterday. So just Chanel, like call out at me if, if there's any kind of delay or something. Yeah, and just a reminder to use the Q&A on uh, the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you have any questions for Sky, and we'll talk about that at the end. Okay, and you're seeing my screen? Yes. Okay. Excellent. Um, so hi everyone. I see some familiar names. That's exciting. I'm I'm Sky Murray. Um, I work at the as, as a consultant for the United Nations Environment Program right now. That's kind of coming to a close. Um, but for the last five school years, I've been um, an assistant professor at the Pacific Northwest College of Art here in Portland, um, and soon to be chair of that department starting July first. Um, and it's a uh, incredible program with an MFA in collaborative design, MA in design systems. 
Um, and so, um, as you'll see, I have a heavy background in marine science and I kind of, I'm excited to always talk with coastal groups and kind of that are really excited about tying those worlds together. Um, so I titled this uh, tonight, The Art of Science and Envisioning Information, um, or more bluntly, data viz for a more engaged public and a better planet. Okay, so, <coughs> sorry, I spent, um, as Janelle said, you know, kind of decades of my life um, on and off sailing the high seas, uh, teaching undergraduates oceanography at sea. Um, one of my shipmates I noticed is actually on this webinar. Um, I've on this kind of bottom right corner here um, have put in worked for the Antarctic US Antarctic program, putting in field camps. Um, on those trips, we did, you know, all kinds of crazy um, research in the middle of the austral winter, you know, kind of plowing through the sea ice, um, putting nets in the water, looking at all different kinds of plankton. Um, we had people on the bridge kind of scouting for whales and, um, uh, I almost said sea otters, um, sea lions, uh, not sea lions, um, seals, and yeah, all different kinds of seals, um, penguins, trying to get a good idea of just, um, they, they are, this specific cruise monitored, um, determined the krills, the krill, uh, count every year and kind of what would the krill quota be or should the krill quota be internationally for the Southern Ocean. And so anyway, every scientific cruise that I did was focused on something different. So some of them were focused on, like I said, zooplankton or kind of big picture ecosystem, um, as, you know, kind of idea of what, what it was like that year, how's phytoplankton doing, how is that going to affect the whole food web. Um, other ones were focused on, you know, putting, as I mentioned, putting uh, scientists on islands looking at you know, kind of uh, looking for fossils, which was actually really fun, <laughs> you know, trying to figure out, well, how has Antarctica changed over the last, you know, 70 million years? And then some were focused on ice fish, so collecting um, creatures from the seafloor and understanding, um, especially for fish that have a difficult time with oxygen and in a quickly warming area like Antarctica, you know, how are they faring? And, you know, kind of in between all of these cruises, I was, I was also starting to do you know, kind of art residencies, I, I decided to go um, back to design school. Uh, this is, these are just, you know, kind of just India ink drawings of a, a Icelandic uh, residency I did in Reykjavik um, um, among many different projects, but just kind of understanding, it, it took a while for me to understand the difference between kind of art and design, which many people don't know, which I can explain. Um, so just, you know, a couple of years ago, after design school, I, I did an art residency at um, the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis in Santa Barbara. And this is a really cool place that doesn't, they're not interested in, in collecting any more data than already exists. Their whole goal is only to synthesize data, kind of in order to ask big questions, like um, what is the future of, you know, how, how do we monitor biodiversity across the planet? Um, you know, even what about just biodiversity? Um, what about the, what's the future of food? <laughs> and so they bring kind of all the major experts that have access to lots of different data sets in different areas and perhaps different domains. And, and they're, they're interested in cataloging that. So they started um, this project, they started a, uh, an art residency a few years ago for the first time. I was part of the first um, cohort. There were just two of us and I, um, Oske Samanchi from North, uh, Northwestern University and I were interested in like, well, what is the future of the ocean? Kind of sense of a future ocean. She focused on ocean acidification. I focused on the future of seafood. And, and this is just a quick, you know, kind of more artistic, but somewhat data-driven example of, well, how do we, what if, what if seafood labeling, you know, what if we could contextualize the state of seafood, whether it's about seaweed salad on the right here, um, this is before I added color. So um, on the left here, we have, you know, wild Alaska salmon. Well, 79% of it is actually exported to Asia because they have a slightly more evolved palate than we do for, for um, better fish. And so um, anyways, just starting to poke and provoke um, and think about, you know, as artists or as designers, you know, can we start asking better questions? And so, uh, oh, and part of that same exhibit, for example, was, um, and I thought I would start with more artistic examples because there's this interesting kind of heavy line between art and design, which is, you know, art is often um, focused on kind of a more reflective, um, 
you know, a way of challenging current representations out there of, of the way we think about, you know, kind of concepts. Um, and it's, it's often, you know, kind of funded by different entities and it's, you, there's a lot more, um, there's a lot of freedom in, 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 in kind of form. Um, design, and I went to design school and information design and data visualization um, at Art Center and then and I got my degree at Northeastern. And it was heavily focused on, you know, kind of applied. It's like the engineers of, of as, as, a, as compared to scientists kind of, you know, maybe not always problem solving, but kind of asking better questions and iterating. And so a lot of my work now, especially at these art residencies, which are definitely more artistic, is, is thinking about um, thinking about the ocean often, but through the lens of, well, who has access? So I now that I'm in an, I work in a design school, I, for example, don't have access to um, like scientific proprietary journals. And so if I were to be interested in Pacific salmon and, and salmon in general, what's the state of salmon these days? Um, it would be very hard for me to have access literally to the latest scientific information. And so some of the work in this, in this same um, gallery show in, in, uh, in 2019, a few years ago, was just thinking about, well, what if I took all of the titles of the latest papers about salmon that were very synthesis focused and put them all in kind of a word tree where you could just see all the titles and, and kind of do it in a handwritten script that is more accessible and humanizing to people. And, and what if I worked with a chef, my friend Chris Wong, and made these salmon bonbons, these delectable um, kind of uh, farm cheese, you know, kind of uh, marinated over several days and kind of lapsing shushong. Um, I I'm sure I butchered that language, but, um, you know, kind of rolled up in this like delightful, amazing treat where you can only have one. And what if, you know, what would the world be like if we just kind of thought about, well, what if we only have you know, if we really, when we ate meat or something from the ocean, we really savored it and thought about it. And so I made these little bonbons that were kind of the constraints where you can only have one at this, at this event. And so moving into like, what is information design and why do I care about information design? And I have a couple kind of just text on white slides here, about like six in a row, um, warning before I get back into all of the pretty imagery. But I, I bring this up because when I think about what information design is, and I, I consider myself an information designer, it's really break, breaking it down into who are we trying to inform and why do they care about this information? And then, um, you know, the formation aspect, well, then, you know, which, what form is best based on, if I answer, if I can answer the first part first, um, you know, who's my audience, why do they care? Then I can answer what form is best and how will they, how will they engage? How, how do I want them to engage? What, what form will work best? And so, you know, when we think about information design, like, you know, you may not know what, what that means or how you would define it. Um, there's a lot of words thrown around daily when we think about information or data, right? You think about information and data and insights and knowledge and wisdom and kind of what order um, do we think about those? And, and Alberto Cairo, um, who is at University of Miami, he wrote The Functional Art and now The Truthful Art. And I feel like he has a few more books, but my students, I have them read The Functional Art because um, he puts, you know, kind of as a working literacy uh, to, to be able to all articulate these thoughts together, he puts um, what he calls this data information knowledge wisdom spectrum in this order, which is, you know, out of all the measurable bits in the universe that we could uh, think about um, quantifying or, or qualifying, um, thinking about, you know, out of everyone in this Zoom room who has how many brown eyes are there? How many people, you know, brush their teeth in the last six hours? Um, out of everything that you could possibly quantify, you know, then, then that becomes variables, right? We call this data where we have organized, we've chosen something to observe, we're putting it, we're organizing it in some way. And this is where communication, communicators come in and that we want to, we want to encode that information in some way, structure it in a way that becomes valuable to someone else. And so, you know, if you think about creating a bar chart, right? You're encoding data with length or a scatter plot. You're encoding it with distance from a couple of different um, parameters. And um, if we're thinking, you know, there's all kinds of ways we can code data, but the goal is that we're doing a good job, a clear, we have a clear way of encoding data um, into information, whether it's an essay that I'm reading in the New York Times or whether it's a beautiful data visualization or, you know, even a photo essay. There's been some curation, some structure that allows me as the, as the 
kind of um, you know user the the participant um, the listener perhaps to to be able to decode that data and as I see more and more of it that becomes wisdom right we we reinforce things we've already heard and add to that knowledge and so I want to just focus on this communicator communicators part and show you some of the work that I've been doing. Um, mainly in, in the marine world, since that's what we're focused on here. Um, but before I get there, I, you know, I've been thinking a lot about how do we, especially about the ocean, about, about nature in general. I went, I went from undergrad, undergrad working a ton at sea and thinking about um, you know, this very holistic big picture sense of um, ocean ecosystems and cultures. We'd visit all these different islands that were so um, dependent on the ocean. And I thought about, well, how is knowledge generated and disseminated typically um, about these topics, um, climate change, ocean, anything. And it's mainly on this left side. It, it is focused on nature, but it's very disciplinary. And it's, as I mentioned, you know, stuff is published in mainly by PhDs, experts um, must have a PhD, even though, you know, we know uh, non-traditional or informal knowledge networks, um, like especially indigenous peoples, um, fishermen even have way more knowledge perhaps of a certain species or ecosystem than others. Um, they're often, you know, analytical and uh, information is often presented rather than allowing people to explore that information for themselves. And so I argue kind of that everybody who is, is kind of generating and disseminating information about, about nature should think about where they are on this spectrum. Are they gearing are, are they making their information accessible? Are they encoding it in a way that's accessible to society um, and, and kind of including lay people and um, allowing people to ask their own questions, explore the data for themselves. And so this all leads to a more prag pragmatic approach. And I mean that in the sense of the philosophical meaning of that, which is um, exploring the senses and how do we learn, you know, in, at recess rather than in the classroom kind of um, getting rid of like formality and hierarchy and rules and focusing on community and engagement and the senses. And so Peter Hall, this is a great, I'm putting kind of the, the references down on the bottom right here, but Peter Hall um, wrote this beautiful kind of 11 page essay that's um, eight of them are beautiful images. And then there's just a few that have, um, it's called Bubbles, Lines and String, How Information Visualization Shapes Society. But he wrote this, um, I guess it's an, an essay, I'm not sure if it's part of a book, but um, I originally saw it at a, at a gallery show in LA, but he breaks visualization down. He kind of frames visualization in kind of three big groups. There's scientific visualization, which, which you know when you see it. Um, if I'll go back to this, this slide in a moment, right? These look like scientific visualizations. There's, um, you know, very well-labeled axes. There's, um, you know, standard error bars, which lay people would not understand what that means. And, you know, just like the, the the aesthetic quality of it tells you it's scientific, right? And, and when we see scientific visualizations, we're like, oh, okay, that's, a, that's some kind of tool for discovery. There's no bias there. It's probably, you know, it's exploring data in a way, you know, taking the most compelling insights and allowing other scientists to hopefully, um, you know, be able to replicate that scientific study if they wanted to. Um, journalism, on the other hand, when we see journalistic visualizations, um, the, the goal, right, is to simplify and explain. And there might be some bias. I might talk to this person, this person, but not that person. But the goal is accessibility. Um, and I'll show you another, I'll show you an example of that um, about marine plastics. So, and then um, we have artistic visualizations, which are, again, challenged traditional representations or more reflective, um, perhaps showing us what the future could look like. And I see... I see the kind of big spectrum here from left to right being um, data, you know, kind of more kind of raw data exploration over to the left to, to just, you know, how do we focus on like narrative and compelling insights um, as, you know, as referenced in narrative off to the right side. Okay, so this is more, this is all related to plastic pollution in the ocean. These are more scientific, right? More you know, photo essay, raw data, kind of documentary style. Then we get into more, um, you know, this this just from the big high level graphics looks a bit more journalistic. And then I'll show you a bunch of artistic examples later. 
Um, so when I think about applying design to data, you know, data visual literacy is on the rise daily, right? We, we're seeing whole huge spreads on the front of newspapers that are just data visualizations. But, um, you know, it, it, it can be scary when people like are not used to seeing, seeing data visualization, um, especially when it, you know, when we actually start reaching out and trying new forms of data visualization. And so to really keep honing in on um, marine metaphors, <laughs> I think you need these few things to kind of dive in the water, right? You need a snorkel, you need to be able to engage, um, you need to be able to breathe underwater. Um, so to create that access, make people comfortable, you need to have nice aesthetics so that people aren't scared away from, from diving in. Um, people need to be able to see, right? They need goggles, they, you know, they need to understand um, the, the breadth of the subject and then also be able to kind of like look at the depth, the micro scale of okay, case studies, maybe like, what are you trying to help me focus on? You need to give them context for why they're, where they are and what they're looking at and, and who they are and why they're there. And then scale, right? You, to be able to kind of dive along and see things, you need to help people understand, um, you know, is it whether it's ecological thresholds or certain relationships, what is it that they're looking at? And so I try to highlight um, engagement, context, and scale and think about that often when I'm, I mean, for anything, when I'm designing curricula, um, but uh, a, a class, a, a lecture, um, but also when I'm thinking about what's appropriate for data visualization. Um, so now I'm just going to show you a bunch of examples in the next 20 minutes. These first ones are the more science-y um, kind of for clients, uh, client um, examples, and then I'll show you a bunch of artistic ones. So um, the three projects I'll show you were for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, work I did for the Nature Conservancy, as well as NOAA together, and then Pacific Salmon Foundation. So often scientists will give me something like this. I'm actually working with a number of these right now. Uh, for, for a big proposal, um, dealing with blue economy stuff and climate change. But, you know, you'll get um, these, these kind of tables from scientists and these kind of box plots that are really important. They all have to do with um, different species, commercially important species that live at different depths, um, different temperatures, salinities, and then they've put them, scientists have grouped them into these assemblages, um, whether that's appropriate to fishermen or not. They have, um, you know, they have these different assemblages and most of them, it, which are actually these different colors, there's four of them, one, two, three, four, and they have to do with kind of where they live um, and kind of the groups of species. Um, I do things just, you know, on a very simple level in terms of information design by just helping, if we're all getting on the same page here, Marine, their goals were to, kind of have these stakeholders, marine policy people, researchers, and, um, and uh, fishermen, um, and help them understand how the center of biomass of their species is moving with climate change. They needed to be able to talk, all kind of talk about these assemblages in a way that made sense to them. And so I just made a simple, to make this, you know, to retain the integrity of my data, retain this table, I had, um, you know, just use basic colors that we're all used to, warm being red, blue being cold, and arrange these, um, these uh, different groups of species in a way that um, is, is more, you know, immediately accessible. And you can see the difference between many scientific graphics. They have what, you know, kind of some people would call chart junk. They have these kind of outlines around every single cell. Um, Designers often use white space uh, to kind of better delineate a lot of these areas. So we don't have kind of, our goal, right, is anything that is not um, data that isn't, that you're not trying to encode shouldn't be there. And how can, how can we get rid of um, any kind of decorative elements that ideally could, could kind of go away? The less is more idea. And then the scientist gave me this, which is like, okay, well, out of all this assemblages, all these different colors of fish, which I don't even know what these acronyms mean, like where are they going with climate change? Where have they been going the last 40 years? Some are going Northeast, some are going Southwest. And so I created this big poster that helped people find their fish, say it's American lobster and understand kind of how far with a hundred kilometer distance here that they're knowing, for example, this fish, they would know in the Gulf of Maine, Maine lobstermen would understand that they're you know, the American lobster has already migrated 200 kilometers to the Southwest. It's just getting too warm and they're seeking other, other places. Um, 
and so you know in, in scientific reports and journal articles we pick out of the 40 species that we had been looking at we just picked a few main kind of um kind of climate winners and climate losers um elena croker is a climate winner it's moving up the the um, east coast and has lots of warm waters to survive in in the future um and other things like the american lobster won't well especially cod cod will kind of go away it, will lose its habitat because it's um, this part of the world is getting too too hot too fast um, more than any other marine area in the world actually. So um, so anyway, these black uh, little stars here are all commercially um, big commercial commercial fishing ports ports. Um, and this just looks at okay all the open circles are the last 40 years where was the center of biomass you know, 30 years. And then where is it expected to go with climate change just based on temperature alone in these habitats and so some of these species are moving you know hundreds of kilometers and it might be more useful for fishermen to start fishing uh, you know um, new fish rather than the ones that they've been traditionally fishing for the last couple of hundred years and so again i get a lot of pictures like this where all these scientists and policymakers are like we figured it out and they, we have this crazy maps of all these dependencies and we know we want to be able to to convey this to people and so often a lot what i what i'm doing is just creating um kind of synthesizing that information putting one thing at the center say it's what's going to happen to fish invertebrates in the gulf of maine like lobster for example and kind of synthesize what you saw before into these basically they're just concept maps and i can't tell you how useful just basic concept maps are you know nodes with directional arrows between them to help get on the same page with people and understand um kind of what's happening who are the main players who are lesser players and kind of does where does this shift how you know what's causing these shifts and and um so i created about 36 of these that were used by noaa northeast fisheries science center and then i won't um kind of leave this presentation to go online but um if you are interested in salmon, especially, um, I worked, I was design director of Periscopic and have worked there for several years. Um, and we've been responsible for creating the Salmon Explorer, Pacific Salmon Explorer website, which is an amazing, just super granular, geographically granular, um, kind of macro, micro scales, multiple scales. Um, just, it's the most robust tool I've personally ever seen. I'm, I'm a little biased, but looking at um, different sam salmon, salmon um, species, uh, genetically different groups of those salmon species and, and keeping track of um, all their different spawning habitat risks uh, within all the watersheds in British Columbia and kind of current pressures, future pressures. You can see all the pipelines moving through. You can search for a town. And if you wanted to make a development, you could see how many salmon habitats you're, you're, you might um, be disrupting. Anyway, it's a really powerful tool. And that's that's kind of where a lot of what I've been showing you is is kind of at its at its peak is these like browser based interfaces that really help different stakeholders like first peoples there who are interested in food security to um, recreational fishermen to policymakers to stock management researchers, um, etc. So um, highly recommend checking that out. It's just salmonexplorer.ca. Okay, so for the artistic parts, um, you know, I I can't tell you enough if, I mean, I highly recommend you doing this on your own, but working with designers and artists uh, really just expands your opportunities for what um, you can do with any kind of data. And I'm going to show you kind of my, kind of an ongoing project started with my MFA thesis in graduate school, um, and then tell you about a project we did uh, with National Geographic um, Ocean Plastic Innovation Challenge um, related to kind of global plastic pollution. So again, when we think about data, data can be anything, right? Um, information is all over. This is a, a weather map. You see weather maps in the newspaper, perhaps, or on your phone. Um, this is just a basic high pressure, low pressure millibar map. I would look at these every, uh, four times a day, I think. Um, we'd get them on the ships when I was working for the US Antarctic program. I would, we'd leave the Straits of Magellan and we'd head south to, to Palmer Station, Antarctica, um, which is one of the US bases. And, and ideally, if you're crossing, you want to stay away from these big red areas. <laughs> Those big red areas are about, you know, 28, 30 foot seas. These other areas are, you know, maybe six, eight foot seas. 
Um, and of course, the, we know if you're used to reading weather maps, you know that the closer the lines are together, the more wind there is. Um, and, you know, the lower pressure is, the, the kind of worse the weather is, kind of lots of ice accretion down there and, and kind of terrible weather. Um, but if I was to show this to you and say, okay, tell me what this would be like, what's, what's the ocean going to look like out there when, I, when I'm crossing in a couple of days? You wouldn't maybe have a clue because a lot of data visualization is just so not humanizing, right? And we really need artwork, we need visual ways or perhaps sonic ways, some way of interacting with our senses or stories to understand and this place, not even the science, just what does this place even look like so we can contextualize what it is that we're learning. And so when I take, you know, Polaroid, Polaroids out there, um, you know, you see these, you know, it, it's much more, you feel like you're present and even, you know, a Polaroid has such a especially nowadays um, that digital photography is so ubiquitous, it has this, you know, we have this sense of, um, uh, you know, I took that, I was there, here's this, you know, you can see the water as it sprayed up on the bridge, um, what it was like in those kind of, maybe, I don't know what that was, maybe um, kind of 35, 40 foot, uh, 40 knot conditions. Um, even though I had kind of finished design school, and um, kind of said goodbye to the sciences for a while. I did go on a cruise in December of 2018. I did a kind of reunion tour for three weeks and went down and, um, and was able to, I decided to, it, it's so hard explaining Antarctica to people or being out on at sea because they assume, okay, oh, you go to sea for seven days and all must look the same. But I know out there that the sea is always changing. It looks different. Um, obviously, the sea state is different, but the, you know the ocean is just this massive reflective. You know, obviously, there's plankton and such that changes the color of the ocean, but also it, it's reflecting the sky. And so, I decided to paint the ocean every day for half an hour. And um, as this kind of study of every day when I was at sea, um, I would do it after dinner. So this is actually like maybe eight thirty nine at night <laughs> um, during the during December, the, the austral summer. And, and kind of kept track of, you know, kind of what colors was I seeing. And this is actually, um, uh, I wrote an essay for this book called Work of Wind. Um, I'll show this at the end with the, the publisher's name. So if you want to, you can look it up, but it's coming, it's all about, um, I wrote an essay for um, this incredible series. Um, and this book's called Work of Wind Sea. And it's about, um, this particular chapter is about how do we know what we know about the ocean? Um, so this is a spread in that book. And so, I did, I, I did this project because a few years earlier, I focused my MFA thesis on, well, how do we convey a continent, you know, an ecosystem that most people will never go to, Antarctica. And when I Google Antarctica, for example, or you Google Antarctica, you literally get this picture perfect, like sunny days, you know, blue skies, <laughs> uh, which is not very common. Um, you know, penguins hopping and just all of these photos, right, are above the surface. We see that there are whales, penguins, um, you know, maybe a seal somewhere, but that's, that's about it. And I know from doing all these scientific cruises in Antarctica, we're, we're pulling out creatures from the ocean that are like man-sized yellow sponges and giant purple sea stars and, and kind of just pink sea pigs, these little um, pink water balloon like animals and um, you know octopus uh, tons of octopi and um, all different kinds of starfish that that the world underneath the water is so much more colorful and so I used a program called processing um, which is made for artists and designers but anybody if I can do it you can do it <laughs> coding coding typically makes me cry it's 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 a, a steep learning curve but um, but processing makes it much easier it, it's made to be kind of intuitive, um, but it is using kind of Java and JavaScript. But so I, I wrote code, like 20 lines of code that basically takes a photograph. And I, if you guys can see these little red dots here, it just subsamples the, any photograph, um, kind of starting at the top left, um, from left to right, top to bottom. And a few more samples are happening for the underwater photographs. So I took 50 photographs from above the surface, 50 photographs from underneath the surface, and then I stacked those pixels that I had kind of pulled off the page, like, like letters on a page, into a vertical bar and then ordered them in RGB order. So you see this kind of color spectrum here. And then I stacked those 50 photographs across the top 
and 50 photographs underwater here. So here's kind of the sea surface is this threshold. So you can clearly, and it was this was published in Popular Science Magazine um, in 2016. And you can see just the static poster quickly. If I just only explained briefly, like, hey, the 50, you know, the, I abstracted all 100 photographs and all the colored pixels from 50 photographs underwater on the bottom, the above the surfaces on the top, you would quickly start asking really good questions like, well, what, what are all these species and why? I didn't think Antarctica had any color. And, and the whole point is to provoke this kind of questioning about, oh, maybe bi there's all the biodiversity that we think of with climate change is actually underwater. Um, and then I created a gestural interface. Um, and this has been, I was just recently, uh, most recently shown at the EU parliament building in Brussels. Um, their R&D team, the EU R&D team asked me to go there and kind of help people think differently, especially scientists about how to engage and how to visualize data. And so you, if you kind of, it's smaller than a cell phone. It's basically like, it's called a leap motion. It's this little infrared sensor and you kind of move your hand up to see kind of up high to see the, the photographs at the top above the surface. And then you um, can zoom in and out and sweep your hand along the bottom to see all of the other uh, underwater photography. Um, so it's a way to actually see all of these um, abstracted images. Okay. And then the last project I'll talk about is, um, is really focused on um, a lot of the plastic work I've been, I, I did for a very long time. So um, between when I graduated undergraduate from Oregon State University here and then did a bunch of, bunch of work at Hatfield Marine Science Center, um, you know, between that and going back to school at age 30, um, I, you know, I, I spent, yeah, 100 nautical miles at sea. Um, and when I, in 2007, I started hearing about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, right? And it was, you know, the world hadn't really heard about this yet, though we, on my trips, we had been, we always had a project studying plastic in the ocean, these tiny little pieces. And so I was like, well, I've never heard of this like giant patch and like, these ships I've been working on forever, they've been collecting plastic for since 1977. What if we, you know, in my free time, I started putting together all these little six week educational cruises where we've been collecting plastic every noon and every midnight along with plankton and all the other stuff we do for student projects. But it's been very robust data sets it's collected the same way on seasonally annually repeated cruise tracks. And so, um, you know, throughout all that work, um, you know, from like even even catching fish that had 47 odd pieces of plastic in their stomach. Um, in 2010, without getting a, any kind of graduate degree, which was perhaps silly of me, um, we published this data in over the years, um, kind of how much plastic is there in the North Atlantic and, you know, science is a very, you know, one of the most reputable journals in the world. And so this has been these kind of these two articles, this was about how much plastic is in the Atlantic um, based on 7,000 net toes almost. And this was kind of what, what kind of plastic is it? How big is it? Oh, it's really, really tiny. Most of it's the size of your fingernail. Um, and then, you know, how does wind affect it? How much is in the Pacific? And then creating some um, teachers articles and, um, and creating a film. If you haven't seen Into the Gyre, it's, it's, I think you can find it on Amazon or at least on Vimeo and it's, um, I can send a free link if you want, but it's all about um, the, the trips we did studying ocean plastics. And so throughout all of that, I, I really became disenamored with kind of the publication process afterwards. Like it would give all these talks to beach cleanup groups and, and outdoor clubs and, and everyone, um, you know, these people really excited about the, the topic just, and, and this is when it was new and not many people knew about plastic in the ocean, just didn't have access to this data that I had worked so hard to put together. And so this is when I went back to school and, and you know, kind of you've heard that story. But, um, but so the crux of this plastic pollution in the ocean story is that, uh, you know, so often we think about this giant, oh, you know, plastic in the ocean, um, and we know, and there is a lot of it, uh, tons of, you know, several thousand metric tons, right, of plastic is, is, is in the ocean and tons is entering all the time. But we think about it as these big giant pieces, but in reality, it breaks down really quickly. And like I said, most of all, 99.9% .9 of it is smaller than the size of your finger now, um, if not smaller. Um, and so it got us thinking uh, a couple of years ago, a couple of um, colleagues, both German, 
Lena Klaus and Moritz Stefaner, we decided to uh, National Geographic and just open their first innovation challenge ever, this Ocean Plastic Innovation Challenge. And we, in the end, um, created, you had to kind of, there was a group that was all about, you know, over 300 some odd people applied for, um, for different projects focused on, well, how do we not have plastic waste in the future? How, how, we, how do we not have petrochemical plastic and plastic be made of other things? And there was this tiny little kind of data viz track um, where our groups competed and everybody else created browser-based websites. We created a data art installation um, 50 feet in diameter that looked at all the plastic ever made on earth and we visualized it with actual physical mainly flip-flops these single-use items and then some other single-use items including um, and we did this on a beach in bali uh, and you know 8.3 billion metric tons ever created on earth how much is still in use how much is incinerated and most importantly how much is 60% that has been discarded and often that is mismanaged waste that that ends up in the ocean. And so the original graphic, you know, again, in a kind of journal you have to pay for if you want to read it, um, looked like this. We made it into a, a Sankey diagram or an alluvial diagram that um, we then bent into circles because it seemed more like a flow that would go with the river. And this is an aerial view with a little temple here and the creek here, um, looking at kind of how much of this discarded plastic ends up in the ocean. Um, we did get all the plastic back and ended up recycling all of it. And here's some peaks. And if you want to see more about that work, it's um, perpetualplastic.net is here. Perpetual, if you just search perpetual plastic, you'll find a kind of movie and a whole, whole site looking at this. But the point is that this kind of work is really like engaging the community and doing cleanups, kind of curating the beach for these different um, items and, um, you know, in the space of a full day, 24 hours, creating a work that can then um, encourage and inspire other work was just so engaging and exciting. And we did go on to win the, the data biz um, track of that National Geographic Challenge. And I got to go to DC and kind of meet the president and all of that. Um, I'm still doing some plastic pollution work. Um, I, in Toronto uh, later this year, I, I kind of with, a colleague created these, um, a former student of mine here, Jake Hickson, who worked in the plastic industry and is now an industrial designer. We, we with Amazon packaging and kind of lots of plastic you can't typically recycle, we created these kind of plastic shards, these kind of giant, provocatively beautiful <laughs> kind of gems um, and the length and the diameter um, end up being weaved, these kind of think of them as beads and they ended up getting woven on this giant uh, map this rope map of the great lakes and they have all of this data this group called synthetic collective on how much how many nurdles these things you see on the left here these how the world ships plastic are these little um industrial pellets um, that they find a lot of them on the great lakes beaches and so we made this big data art map that will be installed in um, the toronto art museum later this year um, one other thing I just wanted to point you to, in case you're interested in the future, I created all the, for a couple of years, I worked with this group called TBA 21 Academy. Um, it's a, a contemporary art foundation focused with an arm that's focused on the ocean. And you can see all kinds of different, it takes a while to load, but you can see all kinds of um, very art based, uh, yeah, a whole library of different, it's an archive. Um, and, and you can find Into the Gyre, that film that I mentioned there. Um, anyway, it's a treasure trove of just artistic representations of the ocean, some policy papers, it's, it's trying to be very um, diverse. And yeah, I'll just end with, again, if, you, if you're excited about communicating about whatever it is that you do, um, just always remember kind of, don't think about what form first, that's usually what we tend to do as humans. Just really consider who your audience is, why do they care before you think about well, what's the best form to engage with them and how you'll do it. And you know, rather than kind of this antiquated idea of design as problem solving, I really think if we can all encourage kind of collaborative, you know, a design is asking better questions kind of mantra, I think um, we can make the world a better place. And so um, a few, a little bit of my work has been published the last couple of years in Migrant Journal, that was that plastics kind of colorful piece you saw. This Market Cafe magazine is the only data visualization magazine out there. And I, I made a data cookbook, uh, a, a recipe in there. 
And then Ka Verlag, K Ver Verlag is a publisher in German. Ka Verlag is publishing a couple of different books this year, one with the Beaufort scale of wind on the cover and that has those um, paintings that I showed you of, of, that I did every day in Antarctica. And then I have a piece about um, plastic pollution and, and kind of scale our, our issues with our human problems with um, scale with the plastic pollution issue in this book called Decapitated Economies. And so you can find me here um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Super, that I could just listen to you talk about all your projects and adventures for the entire evening. <laughs> I love it. Uh, well, we have the floor open for questions. I don't see any at the moment but I can ask one because I always have so many questions. Uh, what was your favorite creature that you found in Antarctica? Because you know what my favorite animal is. So I hope it's the same as <laughs> I feel like there's a few. Um, I mean, I, my favorite is the sea pig. We got them from like 900 meters deep, which is real deep. Wow. And they were uh they just like look like little pink water balloons that have little legs and they feel like pink water balloons it's crazy um ice fish are really cool ice fish is what a lot of what we were studying down there we would find them we would catch them when they were sleeping and bring them up and keep them alive and scientists would study them they have no there's 16 species of them and they have no hemoglobin they have white blood oh and um hemoglobin is what transports oxygens in your in your cells right and so if you don't have something that can glob onto oxygen move it around that's pretty bad in an area that's like warming with climate change where um, warmer water holds less and less oxygen so these ice fish are not doing well um ice fish are really just like they're really ugly frankly but they they've adapted to really soon. and then they're oh my god wait hold on and then there are these crazy worms they're like this long and they have just all these gold spikes that look like like fancy gold jewelry like four, really four, i don't know 24 karat gold or whatever and they're beautiful these like giant polyky worms oh. oh man i need to go to antarctica all right we have two questions uh bruce asks do you ever incorporate poetry in your work oh i love the question um I don't know if it was the way I grew up, but I've always been like terrified of trying to write poetry, but I did an uh, art residency, um, one of two that I've done inland. I'm trying to try the whole inland idea. <laughs> and um, in Italy, in the Alps, we had a resident kind of poet and she, she, she kind of talked. Anyway, I've, I've done, I did a workshop with her at one point where I was trying to, it was about water and thinking about water. Um, but no, I, I, at sea, I feel like some of my, you know, journal entries are somewhat poetic because of brevity, but I, I would love to get there one day, Bruce. <laughs> if you have any tips and tricks or, or, or do any like groups, let me know. All right. Our second question is from Bob. How have scientists responded to your interpretations of their data? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So the, I mean, obviously the ones that were my clients, some of that kind of more straightforward stuff in the beginning was, um, you know, with the graphics and concept maps, like we worked together. And so, but the artistic representations, um, the, I know uh, two of the three authors that were the author of that paper that was like all the fate of all plastic ever made on earth, kind of the 8.3 billion metric tons, where does it go? And they seem really excited about it. Um, and I think that's another journal article that maybe you can't, not anyone can download. And so anyway, I made that data immediately accessible to people. Um, and then I've given talks at like um, data physicality <laughs> seminars where, you know, what happens when we actually make um, data with the, you know, make visualizations with the actual representations of the data, not just encoded in some dots or some lines or whatever. And it's just so much more meaningful, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I have, we have more questions out there. 
I have one more thought on that one, which is, yeah. um, I, and maybe I'll just share my screen real quick. Cause I want to show you guys this because it's so cool. Um, I'll go there in two seconds. Um, okay. We're going to go here. So another, a couple other crazy workshops I've done. I've done, I'm, I'm, I love data and I've, I've done workshops with data for change, which is an amazing group. I highly recommend checking them out. They work with a lot of human rights groups and civil society organizations in the Middle East. And then more fun. That was like full on, totally different. Like you go to the Middle East, like for a couple of different times and, and do work there. This was a, a completely different, more, more trivial, but from an encoding and creative perspective, equally important. There's these data cuisine workshops, which um, I was part of the only one that happened in the United States. Um, Mort Stefaner is again, that one of my colleagues that worked on that plastics uh, pollution piece, um, that, that recent one with National Geographic. Um, but basically the whole idea is that you, it's just how do you, how can you, what are all the ways you can encode data, um, right? We've only, even like the bar chart and line chart have only been around since like the 1700s. Like there are so many ways to encode data and like have a meaningful experience with data. And so if you look at the data dishes at, at Data Cuisine, you basically over a couple of days team up and I'll, sh I'll show you mine because I, I can explain it better. Um, but speaking of marine environments, we called ours a million new friends. And it was about how much fecal coliform is in Boston Harbor. Like, why are people swimming there in the summer? I was just curious because it rains really hard in the summer. And then like, you get tons of, um, uh, you know, it, Boston is sinking and they're like old sewage systems. And I was like, oh, I don't know if it seems like a good idea to swim in like, um, you know, kind of near MIT and in the Charles River, Boston Harbor area. And so sure enough, um, when we added the data, put, put the data together and kind of collated the last five years of the time, there were like 34,000 E. coli organisms per 100 mils, which is a very small amount of water. Um, you know, 400 in the winter less, and then oh, the recreational swimming limits for the EPA are 34. <laughs> and so, in the spirit of creating this data cuisine workshop and learning how to kind of encode data in food, obviously it's about fecal coliform. We did not want this to be a brown food or beverage, but we did think about well, how can we show that it's summer versus winter? Kind of, we have right whales in the summer versus you know, kind of coldness we decided i had never actually made a jello shop before and so we <laughs> we created these jello cocktails um with lemon zest in them and the lemon zest was the kind of analog for the representation of how much um organ organisms were in the water and then we had you know darker blueberry jello for for kind of the, the bottom of the harbor the rocks and then you kind of saw this lighter surface color and so anyway as you look through these it's just it's a cool way to to talk about everybody just had to focus on Boston. And like, if we think about well, what if we did, well, what if we did that on the Orient coast, or if we looked at a bunch of different data from, you know, populations having access to, to liquid assets or, um, you know, proximity to EPA like hazardous waste sites, like, you know, it could be about the fishing, you know, it could be about in different industries on the Oregon coast and how they're doing. But if we, if you think about coding it with food, you kind of plate it, you have this beautiful plate and then we had to make quite a few of them for everybody. And then you have this huge, um, uh, you know, um, everybody around a table and we invited tons of guests and everybody, you know, was able to have this feast together and could it would explain their data first. You're gonna remember that way more than you remember a pie chart, right? And so um, anyway, I just, I love thinking about what are future possibilities if you really want to meaningfully engage somebody with a topic that is kind of esoteric or or perhaps not the most sexy topic to be talking about yeah like fecal matter and swimming waterways <laughs> <laughs> um that is fun that everybody got to eat all the things too mm -hmm. uh all right is there any Last thoughts or parting wisdom where, oh, hold on, we have one. I don't have a question, but thank you very much, Sky and Alaka Alliance for giving this lecture. And thank you for sharing your vision and visualizations from John. Thanks, John, for joining us. Awesome. Any last parting words, Sky, or anything we should be on the lookout for in the future from you? 
No, I mean, my big thing is I'm just so, I'm so excited to start this chair position of the graduate program at, um, at Pacific Northwest College of Art. And um, one thing I get to do in my new program is, is, is as chair is to develop a new MFA program. And I'm pulling hard for design for climate justice, kind of thinking about, especially in this urgent time right now, how can design um, at an art school, we're merging with Willamette University, so we kind of have their graduate programs and MBA programs and policy programs. How can, you know, kind of how can we all come together to start collaborating, collaboratively tackling some of these issues um, and thinking about, you know, like how do we pair with local partners like Alaka and um, and think about, you know, really creating like this these robust like relationships um, that will move forward. So. Um, if you're ever interested in contacting me, I'm very Googleable. Um, you'll find me or ask Chanel. Yeah. Yes, I know. Uh, while you've been speaking, I've been talking with Bob, our board director, about engaging you on some projects. So I will mm. definitely be in touch with you about awesome. the Lock Alliance. Yes. Great. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. This was a Thank wonderful you. presentation. Thanks, Guy, for being here and have a great evening. Bye.